So, welcome to the, uh, today's last session where we have two talks during the last session and then a uh, panel discussion. The first talk will be about EOS connectivity in the Czech Republic which, and this talk will be given by Luděk Matiska. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome you once again and I'm just waiting for the slides to be Available. Oh, okay, we are here. So what I will try to spend the next half an hour plus few minutes, perhaps more, uh, is a presentation of what we are now doing with respect to the EOSC implementation in Czechia. So first, let's start with the understanding what EOSC is to put us on the base, because this is usually the first question. What the hell EOSC is? So formally, it is a web of fair data and related services. Okay, nice, looks fine. We can sell it to politicians, but what it does mean really? Uh, here is the more formal official uh, definition of what EOS is. It's a complex system which is expected to provide access to interoperable research objects. See, it is not speaking about data only, it is speaking about research objects in digital form and value-added services for the whole research data cycle from discovery, mining, management, analysis and reuse. And EOSC by its nature is also going to do this cross-border and cross-scientific disciplines. I try to paraphrase, paraphrase it a little bit and saying, okay, EOSC is something which will support or is supporting or trying to support scientists to properly manage their fair data, to find and reuse data produced by others in an orderly way and supporting interoperability and collaboration. And again, for EOSC at least across Europe, and for the open science cloud across the whole globe. So, okay, so this is kind of a web or complex ecosystem of services, of data, uh, which is something which we will start with to get further. Before we get into the information about what we are doing in Czechia, let's give it a little bit of the international background. So, in fact, now in 2024, we have almost a decade of European Commission support to build the EOSC ecosystem. Nowadays, we have the tripartite to oversee and govern it. What is the tripartite? The tripartite is the European Commission itself, so people representing the EU. It is the EOSC steering board, which is people from the member states, mostly representing the appropriate ministries, governments, to steer the uh, evolution. And then it is EOSC Association, which is a legal body in Brussels, in, in the Belgium, which is expected to represent the needs of those who are uh, targets of EOSC. So scientists, data providers, data reusers, and all the whole community. So this is how the EOSC at the international level is governed at this moment. In fact, the tripartite is currently heavily discussing how this governance model will happen after 2027, because this is the more than the end of the current phase of the current framework program, Horizon Europe, and uh, there is uh, extensive discussion what will happen later. At this moment, another thing which is influencing EOSC at the international level, and this is the result of EOSC procurement, which started 2022 and was finalized in 20, uh, near the end of 2023, and the EOSC notes concept. Here is the public procurement action in 2022, which somehow on this diagram tell us what the procurement was expected to actually achieve. These are the layers the bottom layers, the core technical platform, some core coordination functions, and also some a little bit more advanced by cross-cutting services to deal with data and the digital research objects. So the EOS procurement was a tool or inst 
instrument of European Commission to actually deal with the problem that EOSC also needs some services, some infrastructure behind this complex ecosystem, this complex web of uh, data and services. And the procurement was split into three lots, the core federation services for EOSC U-Node, exchange infrastructure services for the EOSQ node and exchange application services for the EOSQ node. So here you see the winners, the leading partners of consortia, which won the uh, EOSC procurement in individual lots. And the in italics, these are uh, the say the leaders of consortia, where Czechia, through Cessnet, has its own representative. So in both cases, in lot one and in lot three, we have uh, Cessnet involved as one of those who will, as part of the consortia, to provide uh, the services for EOSC, these cross-cutting services. Here is a little bit more detail about what we can expect from the EOSC procurement. So, lot one, the core federation services, these are things like web portal front office, the resource catalog and the registry services, AI, the application workflow management, and monitoring and accounting function. These are things which, if you will be able to remember them, you will see how these things are actually reflected in our national plan of implementing EOSC in Chikia. The exchange infrastructure services are those like managed container service, managed compute, virtual machine service, managed bulk data transfer service. And the last, lot three, is file synchronization and sharing services. Do you remember the sync and share uh, things which were presented earlier by uh, David Antosh? The interactive notebook services, you may remember Mirek Ruda's presentation on the Meta Centrum and the Jupyter Notebooks, which are in fact our contribution here. Managed large file transfer service, you see complement to the bulk data transfer service in lot two for these. So this is what the procurement is currently expected to provide across Europe as the basic set of services available for the research communities. But as EOSC is a web, is an ecosystem, this will not be a LAN. This will just part of the whole system. And that's where the EOSC node concept is coming in. While I said at the beginning that the say kind of a semi-official uh, definition is web services, or web of services and data resources. Now it is changed a little bit to more organizationally structured way, EOSC as a federation of EOSC nodes. So in fact, admitting that EOSC is a special case of large infrastructure where we need some structure to provide the services and we need some governance to actually control what kind of services and with which quality are delivered. EOSC node is currently considered as a distributed structure that provides data and or services to EOSC users as well as other EOSC nodes. So you can imagine like eInfra CZ as a whole is EOSC node or Cessnet at its and, and the partners in EOSC, uh, in e infra CZ are EOSC nodes, but also your university or institution, when dealing with data or providing some services which are actually using the data, may be also considered as a proto EOSC node. There are some conditions which are still under discussion, what will really be needed to establish the EOSC node, but regardless, this gives you some kind of hints, and this is actually the current situation even at the European level about the discussion what the EOSC nodes are, what they will be, how they will evolve. So needs to conform to the requirements and governance rules of the EOSC Federation, and this is exactly where I said about the tripartite now and the post-2027 governance model. These are those who will set up and define these requirements and uh, governance rules. And this is the ongoing discussion. And here we have the EOSC EU node 
which has been mentioned in the US procurement, which can now be considered as a prima inter pares, which means this is the EOSC node for which at least the web exists. The services to be provided by this EOSQ node are those which were procured through the EOSC procurement tender, and it is expected that they will start to be available in autumn this year with, say, full-fledged uh, operation uh, starting next year or near the end of this year. So, in some way, although it is a federation, though it is not a hierarchy strictly, it is considered a core of the EOSC federation, a seat through which the other core, uh, through which the other, to which the other nodes will uh, be connected because it will provide the core cross-cutting services and a piece of the whole ecosystem which will also serve as a model for uh, the other nodes. So at this moment, EOSQ node is the one which is taking care of the procurement results. The web already exists, so you can find more information there about. And this is how the organization of the web services and infrastructure will be with us at least for the next two, three years uh, as a part of this EOSC node federation way of how the EOSC will be organized. So this is the background, the international uh, the situation, and this is really things which are recently still under discussion, not decided yet. I mean, the procurement was closed, the ESQ node will be set up according to the results of the procurement, but the rest is really something which is still taking shape, not being uh, in stone yet. And this gives us opportunity which we are trying to use for quite some time, how we actually respond to these activities and to these things which are ongoing at the European level with our own national activities. Because whether we use the original definition or the new one with this Federation of EOSC nodes, it always expects that there is a federation of something. And a part of the something is and are the national EOSC implementations. So what do we have in Czechia? The background started already in 2020, 2021, in a discussion with the ministry, and as a result, we get this architecture of EOSC implementation in Czechia, document accepted by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports in 2021, as the basis for the follow-up, for the new calls, for the funding, and so uh, At the governance level, we have a coordination board for EOSC, at the ministry since December 2022. We have, uh, I mean, the ministry, say, defended support through structural funds. So Open Science EOS sees its series of calls, which almost three billions, which is approximately 120 million euros uh, for the period of 23 to 28, is dedicated to actually supporting open science slash EOSC uh, implementation in Czechia. And here, because this is the eInfra CZ conference, we have a special role as eInfra CZ large research infrastructure because we are since the beginning a partner of the ministry to discuss the architecture and support. We were those who helped to shape the architecture document and we were those who discussed with the ministry the scope of individual calls for the uh, actually spending these three billions of Czech crowns. And we are expected as Infra CZ to share this implementation responsibility with some other partners as well, especially large universities, Institute of Academy of Science. So we started with one project, with the with the thing. Or, or EOSC CZ, no, 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 not, not the project, but, but the concept, which is also, say, already reflected in the architecture document, that we decided, and remember, we started this 2020 and then came into the first published document in 2021, that we will narrow the focus of the whole EOSC, that we will not try to catch everything what can be EOSC, but that we will translate EOSC into data into management of the fair data. 
So the primary target of our EOSC implementation are data produced by scientists, and naturally the scientists themselves and support for them. And the goal which we have, which is unofficial, but still something which I am presenting uh, uh, not only recently, make sure that at the end of the intervention, so at the end of 2028, at least 80% of all data producing scientists they know where to store the data permanently. Where are the archives, as David mentioned? Where are the proper repositories for them? So when they are writing their data management plans, they are not confused. They know, and they eventually have proper support for that. The secondary target is scientists looking for data. Because this is the other sort of scientists, those who need the data for their own research, but they are not, they may not be producing the data or it may be a separate activity of them. And here we would like to make sure that all scientists know where to start looking for their data, for the data they need. Naturally, we cannot guarantee that they will find it. We cannot guarantee that the data they need for the research exists, but we hope to be able to guarantee that anyone who is looking for something knows how to either get to the data or be left out uh, with uh, not being able to find anything. And the corollary is that the, all these data we are speaking about are fair. And if you look at this as the vision of what we would like to implement, it is okay. We need to support the scientists who are producing the data and we also need to have an architecture of the EOSC implementation which helps people who are searching for data. And we would like to make sure that all the data which is covered by this scope is fair, which will be especially interoperable and reusable. Findable, that the secondary goal. So what do we have as the national uh, CZ architecture? We have the data national because we said that we narrowed the focus of the EOSC implementation, so we focused to national data infrastructure, a system which is composed from national metadata directory, repository platform, services and tools, individual repositories, training methodological support. I think both David and, and uh, Mirek mentioned that we have as a plan of that to make sure that the people know how to efficiently use what we are building. and. Uh, all this is a part of a larger system covering also publications. Here is a schema. It is, in fact, the only, I think, the only picture I'm using. Uh, the second one, I, I use it in the procurement, uh, which I'm using in my presentation. The part which is gray represents what we do as the implementation of EOSC within the country. We have the metadata repository or directory which I will discuss about, as the entry point. We are part of even wider activity, which is done together with the National Library of Technology, where uh, the, we are trying to cover more of the open science going toward the publications. So this is the right part of this diagram, where you see new generation platform for the digital libraries, including printed documents, electronic born documents, and all this stuff, all the search. So this part, we are focusing more on the, what you can call classical scientific data. But naturally, we have already heard Professor Haig with the LLM, where the texts themselves are research data and objects of their own research. But what we are trying to do is the following. Oh, no? Yeah. We, I will start with the second part, the National Metadata Directory, which you see here, and this is the Invenio-based high-level metadata repository, which is harvesting metadata across the whole, or will be harvesting metadata across the whole ecosystem, which will have some high availability, high throughput features to make sure that it is not a weak point of the whole infrastructure. And this is the point where we expect you can start searching for your research data. What we expect is that it will become obligatory for any repository which would itself consider a part of the national data infrastructure and which would consider itself as a 
getting some funding or at least asking for some governmental national funding, either within this series of projects or outside, will have to allow the metadata to be harvested to this national metadata directory. So this is the entry point. What we did since 2023 is something which is not visible on this picture, but which you can take as this gray area behind. And this is that we created, among other things, the secretariat, the back office of the EOSC implementation in the Czechia, which is a high-level support body. For example, it includes the working group secretariat. We will hear about working groups in a minute, which is overseeing and monitoring the whole EOSC CZ implementation process. We got the first bunch of funding. We got exactly for this to support the setup of this monitoring and overseeing back office, which is working closely with the ministry, which is expected here to oversee all the projects related to the EOSC implementation in Czechia, which has a strong uh, collaboration with a strong analytical section, which is and expect to be able to provide all the necessary data which we need to actually monitor the progress of the uh, EOSC. Here, what is more important is this national repository platform. Again, I will return here. You see it as the more wide space within this gray space. And what is it? This is the core of what we would like to build. Because we said we would like to cover scientists who need to store permanently their fair data. So for this, you need the capacity and you need some kind of repository systems for them to find the place where to store the data because already David said files without metadata cannot be archived, cannot be considered fair and we are focusing on fair data. So we would like to build such an infrastructure which will provide sufficient capacity. You have heard a little bit about uh, in David's uh, presentation, so I will not repeat here. And the point is that this is the core of what we are building. This is the storage. These are the platforms which we will build. And then we expect to build repositories on top of these the repositories which are more thematic oriented themselves. There we have a set of common services. I mean, remember the definition, web of fair data. Okay, the data are what we hope to be stored in these repositories within the national repository platform. And then we have end related services. Here is what we will implement in the first phase. These are naturally things which you have heard about in this EOS procurement, AI and strong access control. That was there as well. We will provide metadata profiles management and licensing support. This is not covered by the EOS procurement, but we, through the discussion at the national level, we found out that these are things which are extremely important to support both interoperability, that's metadata profiles, I mean, how to actually work with metadata, how to set them properly on top of the data, uh, individual data sets, and licensing support, which is extremely important for reusability. Because you need to know the licenses covering the data to be sure that you are using the data in a, in a proper and legally approved way. Then data and repositories verification, which is again a service which is not covered by the lot, but by, by the procurement. But there are quite a few of EU projects which are dealing exactly uh, with tools and methodologies to do that. So we are just reflecting. I mean, we can be seen as just reflecting this at the national level. We have data management plan support, data stewardship wizard, and especially what we will do are actionable, actionable, actionable uh, data management plans. What it does mean? This will be data management plans which describe what you will do with your data, not only as a text, but as a basis on which the national repository platform can actually execute some steps 
for example, to make sure that the data are properly annotated, that they're properly covered by the licenses, that they are properly exposed to the national metadata directory. All these things described within your data management plan, we hope to be able to somehow put into the national repository platform and the services within them, and then having them actually executed. So, lessening the requirements on researchers when they are actually producing the data to deal with this data management, which can be automated. This is an uh, important part of what we are trying to do. Automatic data collection, there you have bulk data transfer, which is exactly fast file transfers between the repositories, between users and repositories, but also integration, automatic data collection means a fast transfer of raw data from instruments to the repositories in cases where you, as scientists, want to have these things happen. And last but not least, also integration with compute and analytical infrastructure and workflows. So what you have heard about the e-infra-CZ, about supercomputers, about Metacentrum, this is exactly the things which we would like to provide, I mean, within the EOS procurement, remember, for example, working with notebooks, a notebook as a service. There are virtual machines, which from my perspective are just a low level of what we would like here to provide at slightly higher level going up to the workflows. But again, you see here a clear connection to what is and will be available at the European level and our own way how to, uh, how to say, provide an environment which fits perfectly into this European uh, ecosystem. Things which I just want to mention are cybersecurity compliance and user experience. I mean, cybersecurity is something which has to be always remembered and we don't want to have it just as an added feature. So we plan to have the security by design as much as possible to work also with compliance, all this legal compliance, but also work with sensitive data and other parts to make sure that what we prepare as the ecosystem and what the services, that they will not need the scientists and to dwell into the implications and themselves to, to deal with the legal implications of this environment, but instead of that, to prepare the whole, not only the licensing part, but the whole legal part of whether the people is allowed to <laughs> store the data, whether we are storing the data in a proper way related to the actual uh, features and properties of the data. And last but not least, one thing which we would like to do at the national level is to work closely, not only security by design, but also user friendliness by design, or at least monitoring the user friendliness of the services and components which we will be gradually building and, and putting into the production to make sure that it is not driven completely just by IT geeks with their own view what is best uh, usage, but also having and collecting a lot of the feedback from the end users to make sure and then helping to improve the individual services in a way that they will actually be acceptable by user communities. Last but not least, naturally, training and all the methodological support, training materials, documentation, training support. We have virtual training center for EOS CZ. And we also are supporting the data stewards community countrywide to make sure that we are working with the people who are actually at the institutional level, kind of a front ends or interfaces to the scientific teams. We are trying to work directly with scientific teams as well, but also through the data stewards to create a community, to create a way of the mutual understanding of what and how we would like to implement EOSC. So EOSC is about collaboration. So my last few slides are thematic working groups. We set up eight working groups in this area, trying to engage the research community. If you look at these, and especially if you look into more detail, you will find out that at our case in Czechia, all these thematic working groups 
are strongly connected with the large research infrastructures. Uh, naturally, in cases that there are no large research infrastructures, then we are just building the ecosystem from scratch. But in all other cases, we are trying to make sure that the large research infrastructure are directly involved in our work. So the role of these thematic working groups is, as I said, to involve researchers into the EOSC definition and implementation, to use them to collect feedback on our plans and also on the realizations to discuss strong and weak points of what we plan to do and what they need, because these are weak points from their perspective on the data management and working with them. And to prepare input for the targeted support of fair data handling, which is the call under finalization in the, so how to do, what kind of repositories to support at the national level, what kind of interoperability support is best for individual, for, so for, for the individual thematic areas, uh, scientific domains, to actually use the funding which we are getting from the ministry in the most efficient way. There will be a cluster, thematic cluster oriented call, which is just finalized by the ministry to be launched at the end of May or beginning of June, I always forget the precise date, which is targeting the research communities. Because what I have speaking about was more cross-cutting foundational services, which very well match to the EOS procurement, because the EOS procurement goal is exactly to do this cross-cutting. But on top of this, now we have to focus, and we want to focus within check implementation of EOS to the research communities themselves to give them money, support for the repository setup, for the evolution of those repositories which exist, to set up new repositories and if possible, to the extent which we would like to, to naturally support as much as possible, using NRP infrastructure where appropriate, using the NRP services, some of them will be mandatory like the metadata directory, the access control, uh, some of the verification tools which we will ask them to actually run to get the information about their repositories. But otherwise, it will be more steered by the research communities and clusters, thematic clusters, to make sure that we are targeting the right the weak points of the data management at the national level. So we will have some core partners within this project. We also made an agreement with the ministry that we will have what we call mini projects, that the project itself will be allowed to do what you may know from the European Commission calls the cascading projects, making its own call for small sub-projects to deal with specific areas. And this way we hope to have more flexibility during the implementation of the project to actually involve even smaller groups for which being part of the large project may be too bureaucratically difficult and uh, targeting the effort and evolving the effort during the execution of the future project to actually cover weak points. This may also go to things which we currently don't see as a part of the implementation of these cross-cutting services, and this may help us to cover the gaps between what we know and foresee now and what we will need in two, three years from now. So this is just kind of a final or closing, uh, final recapitulation. Who builds what? We have two projects which are already running, which are doing this uh, background and the uh, national metadata directory. We have the NRP for research data project, which was just submitted on Friday, but in fact starts already the implementation, which is these cross-cutting services to be implemented, including the whole uh, data storage needed for EOSC and the clusters project I just uh, mentioned. This is, if you are interested in EOSC, how you can orient uh, within this ecosystem. If you want to build and take care of a repository, so you have your data, but you don't want only to store the data somewhere, you would like to 
have a little bit more about, then the NRP project is your perfect partner, and in future the cluster project maybe. If you are a scientist looking for a place to store your own data, the EOCZ and the future clusters project are your partner. If you are a scientist looking for relevant data, then EOSCZ, because it takes care of the national metadata directory, and to some extent the clusters project are your partners. Because this will, however, for the search of the data, the close collaboration with the research communities is a must. And if you are just interested, the EOSCZ is your partner. So here is just the last thing, the schedule since 2023. What I would like just here to mention, in 2024, 2023, for, for the setup of the scene, creating the uh, building blocks, the more the organizational building block. 2024 is setting the scene in terms of building the technical blocks, which will be available through 2025. So the next year is the year where we expect the national repository platform and the cross-cutting services to be available and the first repositories to be actually uh, operating. 26, everything fully operational, the repositories supported through the clusters project, fair data management supported through that, and also start or have not to start, start should be 2025, but heavily involvement in the sustainability discussion, which meaning how to cover the cost and the evolution post 2028 till which we have the funding assured uh, currently. And 27, 28, we will have the final survey, the first survey we plan for this year to actually see how we across the survey will go across all the scientific disciplines and we would like to get from this uh, message what really we were able to change. How this whole situation changed through the implementation through the things which we did. And this is the summary of my presentation where we are with the EOSC in Czechia. We have quite some strong support from the ministry and also from scientific communities. These working groups are really covering practically all relevant scientific communities and the people are willing to work with us to define what will be the EOSC in CZ. We have strong international collaboration, it can be demonstrated through the participation in the EOSC, I mean successful participation in the EOSC procurement. We naturally are one of the active EOSC association mandated organizations and we also have at the national level close collaboration with the EOSC steering board representatives uh, from the ministry. We have strong focus on management of fair data. This is the core of our EOSC implementation in Czechia. We have strong interaction and collaboration with eInfra CZ. In fact, eInfra CZ is the core for the implementation for the architecture. You have heard it in David Antosh presentation, in Mirex presentation as well. And our advantage is we have a clear architecture. We have a clear implementation schedule at this moment. So we hope that we are on the track and we have systematic ways how to work with the research communities to make sure that what we are developing really serve them to help them with the data management. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. So thanks for a very clear presentation. Uh, are there any online questions? There are no online questions. So are there any local questions? So Thank you. A very informative presentation. Um, in my travels and circles, I hear lots of conversations around concepts such as data lakes, digital twins, uh, and these necessitate collaboration on a pan-European or even indeed global scale. Your use cases and implementations you described have a very strong national focus there. So could you perhaps please just expand a little and explain how a digital twin, let's say a digital earth, uh, would have shared data, accessible data on a, a broader rather than just a national approach? Yeah. Uh, the, the way how we are looking at the EOSC implementation in the country is really to give to the emperor what 
should go to him. So for this, from this perspective, what we are trying to do, and that's why I so explicitly mentioned these, uh, say, the fitting to the EOS procurement staff is to build at the national level the cross-cutting things which can be easily connected with whatever is developed across Europe. The data lakes are something or, or similar ways which goes in our, say, in our, I would say, stack to the level of repositories and beyond. And there is what we need is the strong and what we base our future on is a strong collaboration with the research communities. We don't want to create a data lake and then start to become sellers. Oh, don't you need a data lake for your research? We would like to do this other way around. We have here the pieces. We are able to put them together. We guarantee that these pieces are fully interoperable at the European level at least. And it is up to you, the research communities, to tell us, you need data lakes, fine. Let's discuss how these components will help us together to create what you actually need. But we don't want to be, apart from the really agreed core services like AI, to be those who are pushing for some particular more IT-oriented solution and then trying to convince them that this is exactly what they need. So our, our answer is we try to have technical interoperability as much as possible to make sure that there are no walls, no, no problems, that it is smoothly integrable. And also our own solution is smoothly recombinable. And then we, that's exactly why I mentioned that this is about collaboration of the work with the working groups to make sure that they will tell us what they actually need us to build at the high level. Yeah, so I suggest to take the last question and then we have a panel as well, so there will be more. Yeah, we will have a panel for, for, for discussion. Thank you. Um, it sounds like you have the data management uh, idea ready, the ideas ready for the, for the users. Uh, given that it's kind of a rule of thumb that uh, any mess in the room is exponentially increasing with the size of the room, and given that every living uh, organism, organism expands to its maximum size until it starts deteriorating its own health, what is the uh, philosophy, and specifically what are, the, what are the limiting factors for storing the data? Is it like, is it, are you imposing costs? Are you imposing uh, longevity? Uh, are you imposing usefulness of the data? Uh, <coughs> at this moment, all things which you mentioned and eventually others are still open. We at this moment are not imposing anything because as I said with the timing of these clusters oriented project, one of the things which we want with our monitoring and superseeing and overseeing responsibility within the first project, we will push on this project to actually not forget that they, the communities, have to take into account both the cost, both the manageability of what they want to push. That it is their decision, not our decision, to tell them whether they should store one petabyte, 500 terabytes, or 50 petabytes. But that they have to live with the consequences of their requirements. We have as a plan for the next year, around the end of the next year, to publish kind of a weight paper with possible sustainability models after 2028, especially stressing these things of the control, how you keep the mess under control. And definitely the cost will be part of that. The need of the infrastructures, uh, need of the research communities will be the other. Um, societal impact may be maybe the other as well. And then we plan, as I said, 2026, to actually start having countrywide extensive discussions. And at the same time, I mean, the, the European discussions will be more or less aligned with, with, this, with this as well, to actually come out with some conclusion which will definitely be different for different scientific areas how to deal. So no, we don't want to be those who are imposing any limits, but we definitely will tell the communities that if they will not 
make an order within the data mess, they will pay the consequences. In paying in any way, not only monetary one. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> And the last presentation today will be given by Matej Antol, and it will be about a roadmap of e-infra. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you can. It's always a treat to, sorry, one, two. Should I turn this off? <laughs> okay. It's always a treat to have a presentation after a full professor. <laughs> So who envies me, you still have a chance to change my place here. Uh, I'm going to have a little lighter presentation than all the presentations before me. And I will start with Galileo Galilei. I think he was doing research somewhere around 15th or 16th century when it was actually the end of the Dark Ages. I would call it also the do-it-yourself age of science. And he had two things at his disposal when he was looking at the stars. First was his brain. <laughs> It was all the ideas, all the hypotheses he could come up with, and all the things, strange or normal, that came, <laughs> uh, came across it, and he dared enough you know, to, to think about whether it could be true. The second thing was his telescope. And I say his because he created him himself. He didn't have any infrastructure at his disposal back at that age. <sighs> Fast forwarding, and we had many more people interested in the astrology many more telescopes, and many more resources put together to look at the stars. At some point, somebody came across and said, you know what would be a great idea? Put one huge telescope at a big pile of explosives, get it into a space, get it into the shadow of Earth, and look even further away. Voila, the James Webb Telescope. Actually, this is an example I stole from Branjo Jancic, so thank you for that. <laughs> And this is maybe one of the best examples I have yet seen to explain what a research infrastructure is. Of course, this is a research infrastructure that's dedicated towards one narrow specific use case. That is, looking at space, it's some portion of physics. It's a bit more complicated with e-infrastructures. There are two main reasons for that. The first is, uh, e-infrastructures have to serve all scientific domains. So we cannot specialize that much. And, you know, by the nature of IT, it's not very well understood. The other thing is that it's not very tangible, you know. You can imagine a telescope, you can't quite imagine IT or e-infrastructure. So it's a bit more cloudy with the infrastructures. Ha, 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 joke. <laughs> European Commission, <laughs> sorry. European Commission uh, has a definition of the infrastructures, and I selected three terms that I think are the most important in that. That is, to provide resources and services. The second, to serve research communities. And the third, to foster or encourage innovation. And I will try to explain how I see each one of them in light of the infrastructure before I actually show you the roadmap, which is the title of the presentation. Part one, resources and services. Uh, you have seen a couple of presentations given by my colleagues. First, on data transfer and networks by Jan Ružička. Second, data processing by Mira Gruda and then Vid Vondrak, the director of the IT for Innovations. And then data storage, both by David Antos and now Ludek Matiska in some sense, uh, in regard to data uh, infrastructure built within EOSC in Czech Republic. However, the Infra CZ has many more services and many more areas in which it is engaged. For example, we have multimedia services. The AAI infrastructure, just briefly mentioned, uh, things regarding uh, cybersecurity and anything that relates to scientific data in general. At this point, I would like to highlight the hard work of people at the Infra CZ. I think it's around 500 people who are actually working on these services and on these environments, which are then used by the users, by researchers, and they never see those people in their life. So, thank you, everybody. However, why I have a greenhouse on my slide. Uh, in some sense, there is a trade-off in provision of services and actually getting to the communities. You have to have what I would call perfection by isolation. Uh, you can see that there is an environment inside the greenhouse which isolates all the plants from everything that's going on outside. 
You can be efficient because it's, it's simpler, it's structured. You have the shelves, the sporting uh, processes or, or any organizational things that you have in the infrastructure to keep it all steady and neat. However, you also need a door to let the users in. Now, this is the tricky part. We have, of course, conferences such as this one, service desk, web, documentations, but they are never perfect, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> At the same time, research looks more like this. It's a mess, it's an old forest. It's not, uh, it's not a greenhouse at all. So the question is, and it's always a struggle, how do you balance these two things off? You need to have it efficient on the inside, but you have to reflect the mess that it's outside, that is the modern science. So the nature of the research is dynamic. Fluently getting to the second pillar, which brings us to research communities. Now, just to give you an idea, most of you are from Czechia, but we also have some international guests. So there are more than 200 research uh, institutions recognized by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports, and you can see their distribution on a map. Maybe you want to remember that a little bit because it corresponds, of course, to the largest cities, largest universities, and the Institute of the Academy of Sciences. Another picture, uses of InfraCZ. Uh, Briefly, our estimation is that Czech Republic has about 40,000 researchers. We now register 5,000 researchers interacting with the infrastructure. I would say that it's a great number because not everybody in a research laboratory or in a team is actually interacting with the infrastructure itself. So this gives us some basic idea about how much coverage do we have in Czech Republic. Second image, bringing us closer to the communities themselves are the 40, or 42, I think, research infrastructures in Czech Republic. Now, why do I point it out? The first picture showed the institutions. The institutions actually host a number of different domains. This selection gives you some basic idea about what kind of research is being actually conducted at this, uh, these institutions. It brings us closer to the domain-specific requirements and further away from the institutions. Fasting forward, and I will mention yet again the working groups of EOSC, mentioned by Ludwig just before me. <laughs> Hi, Zdenka. Uh, we have established two years ago 12 uh, working groups for EOSC and development of national data infrastructure. These 12 groups together count 350 people who are actually actively discussing and designing the national data infrastructure its services, metadata standards, and the things that researchers need in every respective domain. I think it's a good example of how we can actually approach these, uh, these, uh, these communities of researchers and address their specific needs. And yet again, just to give you an idea about the distribution of these 350 people in Czech Republic, you can see that the map is quite similar. Well, I'm not saying it proudly, you know, like, okay, so it's solved and we can move forward. I just think that it's a good idea or a good example of how we could actually approach that in the future. Part three, fostering innovation. Uh, I have three big themes that I see on the horizon or the things that we will have to address in the near future. First one is, uh, already mentioned, secondary use of data. The whole implementation of EOSC in Czech Republic revolves around fair data and data repositories just so the research data can be reused. The reason for that is simple. When you look at the service models that we employ in the inner operations of the infrastructures, we are trying to be efficient. Vid Vondrak had a beautiful presentation about the details of how he's trying to approach that with the supercomputers how you want to work with the resources so you know they are just actually computing some, some research stuff. The question is whether we now have a good model for using the results of these computations. And I think that there is already a consensus that no, that there is still some value in the data that are actually produced in a primary research and we want to recycle them for other researchers or maybe public to use again. Second, intensive use of AI. Today, somebody said that there is a hype concerning AI, and I totally agree. The other thing is that, although it's not magic, and it's not dark magic, uh, 
it is extraordinary. We are stepping into the era where I think we must be humbled when it comes to the design of human nature. You know, it's not that the machines, the AI or ML models would be so perfect or elaborate. It's that we have some limitations and we now can see some of them. I think, and I think most of the research communities agree, that with the abundance of data, and if we are able to put all the data together, if we are able to label them and use the metadata correctly, the, we will see the rise of use of machine learning methods in selecting the new patterns, in formulating new hypotheses, and coming <coughs> up with new ideas. So we are just at the beginning. Third, and I won't be talking about that very, very much, is quantum. I will just briefly mention, they say, that there is a quantum computer on its way, that you can use it in networks, and that it may revolutionize cryptography, <laughs> which will be maybe a problem. So, the roadmap. Uh, please, I'm a little bit cheeky here. In 2011, Elon Musk estimated that he would put a man on Mars by 2020. This is just an honest estimation on what's going to, uh, <laughs> what's going to happen in the upcoming years. Uh, please take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't think that every single point that you will see will actually be exactly where I put it on the, uh, on the time frame. Quite simple, we are here. First, uh, we now have a network described by uh, Jan Ružička. What we will see in the upcoming years, and this is a bit lazy part, is continuous maintenance and extension of the network, and we should end up with uh, DWDM uh, with capacity or capacity throughput of 100 to 400 gigabits per second. I think that one of the questions <laughs> directed at Jan was actually whether we won't see one terabit, and he said, well, yeah, maybe tomorrow, which gives you <laughs> some idea about the dynamicity of the infrastructure, which I think is a good thing. As long as we will have some use cases for that, we can be dynamic and we can have bigger throughputs if necessary. Second, data processing. We had wonderful presentations regarding Metacentrum. I'll just recapitulate that we have uh, 54,000 CPUs, 500 GPUs, and one DG DGX machine in a Metacentrum, and two supercomputers you can see listed above. What we'll see in the upcoming years is with the Metacentrum, and this is yet again a bit lazy, is continuous maintenance and extension. But Mirak was talking about the platforms as a service, uh, software as a service with all the platforms like Kubernetes, OpenStack, and the batch systems that what is actually accepted with the smaller granularity. So imagine that in this, in this green uh, rectangle. Regarding supercomputers, we are expecting to install a new supercomputer which will be more suitable for machine learning during this year. Somewhere around ish end of this year and beginning next year, we should have a quantum computer at the IT for Innovation Center. Uh, regarding Carolina supercomputer, there should be a speed up for memory bound workloads. I think it's five times speed up for memory bound workloads uh, somewhere next year. And then in 2026, new supercomputer, which will uh, be general purpose supercomputer, it won't be focused on the, on the uh, AI ML things. If I am correct, I think that new supercomputers at IT4i are traditionally in top 50 supercomputers when bought new. Yeah, Branio is nodding, so it's true. Then we have something that I would say is data access. Normally we think of this as two different things. One is AI infrastructure, which is authentication and authorization infrastructure. The second is sensitive cloud and FEGA. Uh, I think Peroster had it actually in his slides that uh, the CSE is also working on FEGA. It was, it was somewhere in the slide. FEGA is uh, Federated European Genomic Archive. Uh, it's the environment which is directed towards storing and let's say in general sharing or analyzing genomic data. Actually, we have a number of projects for that, like GDI and One Million Genomes. But this is yet another area that uh, Infra will address. We will see two big bumps or two big extensions of the capacities in these environments for sensitive data in the upcoming years. Fourth, data storage. Uh, we now have about 50 petabytes of user data 
uh, user data, sorry, of research data <laughs> stored across uh, the infrastructure. It spans from scratch at the Metacentrum for general purpose data uh, stored by the users. They are typically unstructured, and this is the rough estimation of the user capacity. I think David Antosh was mentioning that the ratio between the real capacity and the user capacity is one to three to one to five. It really depends on the number of replicas and other maintenance things. We will see, yet again, continuous maintenance and extension of this environment. But as an extra, we have data reuse, which is also a part of the data storage in some sense. And that's the things that Ludwig Matiska was actually commenting on in his previous presentation. Now we have something I would call technical, organizational, and training foundations for fair data management. Uh, it's EOS Secretariat, EOS Training Center, and some technical, uh, technical background or, or first steps towards the uh, national data infrastructure. Actually, two months ago, uh, we released National Metadata Directory, uh, already available, uh, publicly available online, uh, mentioned by David also. Uh, this year, we expect to have a pilot of the National Repository Platform, which actually means that research groups, either at the infrastructures or anywhere else, with the capacity to have their own repository, will be able to use the repository platform to create their own space in that. This is actually the next rectangle. So we will see domain repositories emerging from that point onwards, we hope. <laughs> in 2000, uh, later in 2025, the first release of FAIR data tools and services. Of course, we do not know the scope or the exact function of all of the services. It is related to persistent identifiers, uh, data management, data stewardship wizards, and many other things that we need if you are handling fair data. However, it will be an ongoing effort, so we will release it and we will see how it's going to uh, relate to the communities and to the users and then reflect on these changes in the upcoming years. Uh, Catch-all repository, the idea is that Czech Republic will have domain repositories for data that will have some commonalities. So you may have some special functions while you want to browse the data or interconnect them with, let's say, Europe or the rest of the world with some specialized technologies or, or uh, systems. However, we will also see a catch-all repository for all the data that will either not fit any specification or really for any other reason wouldn't have their own home to be stored in. Here I have continuous AI integration with repositories and services. I see a future in which I will have only one account in the whole Czech ecosystem, and I will be able to approach all these services within. It is something that we are working on in the infra CZ, and we're almost there. However, the national data infrastructure will be hosted by a number of different partners, and we hope to see that this will also translate to the national data infrastructure as a whole. And in the end, but it really depends where the end is, we will have full national repository platform with 50 petabytes of user capacity, national ecosystem of repositories, and full set of fine-tuned fair data services and tools. Of course, I say final, but it's final only in this uh, time frame. I expect somebody else having this speech or this talk in five years telling you something different. I yet again remind you of Elon Musk's, so you may Follow this, but take it with a grain of salt, please. So to sum it up, in FRACIZ, we have this, this slogan on the website, Together for Science, is a merger of three infrastructures. And the commonality, the main commonality, the main goal that we have is to engage research communities, such as the ones in the uh, working groups of EOSC, and to foster science by smart and robust solutions, whether it's platforms, technologies, projects, anything else, to process, transfer, store, access, and reuse data, research data in Czech Republic. Of course, we are not an island, so in a context of European Union and the rest of the world. And on behalf of the whole Infra CZ, thank you for attention, and thank everybody who contributed to the slides, some of the data, and some of the pictures you have seen actually were provided by some of my colleagues, so thank you very much. So thanks for this amusing presentation, and I really appreciate uh, not only 
the graphics, but as well references to those photos and pictures which you Thank shared you. there. So that was great. So we have time for for a question specific to this one. Uh, do we have any online questions? So. If there are no questions, let's thank again to Matej. <laughs> There is and, a question, and now I we think. will start a panel where you will have a possibility, uh, another possibility to start a question. So now uh, let's start the panel. It's disting our distinguished professors and directors. So uh, the panelists are uh, Ludwig Matiska from Serice C. You know all those uh, people from the morning session already, so all of them, they are presented already. Uh, Vít Vondrák uh, from IT4I, Per Ester, Per, uh, ah, yeah, per, 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 per from CSC, Erwin from MPI, er, Erwin Laure, Paul Raus from Giant, Jan Haich from Charles University, and uh, Matej, please, uh, can you join us as well uh, for, as a representative of INFRA? <laughs> so we have several microphones. I can give it to you as well. So we have something like 30 minutes uh, for this discussion, and uh, we can take questions from, from you, from here, and as well uh, from uh, via uh, Slido uh, online. To start the discussion, I have prepared uh, the first question, and I would like to know your opinion because you are mostly representative of uh, providers, of service providers. So I would like to ask you, how do you think you succeeded, I mean, to provide your services to users? What, where do you see that there are some, if you see, if there are any bottlenecks? And then I would like to ask users if they have the same view, and as well, we have a representative of, of, of a one, one group which says that if they get a Lume G for one year, it's quite okay, so probably they will see some bottlenecks there. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, networking services, so with uh, Jeant. Okay, thank you. Um, I think... It in Mian's presentation uh, today, he introduced the refresh pan-European network, the, the latest instance we have there. And one of the success factors in the development of that refresh network was around co-delivery uh, and, and engagement. So one of the initial activities that we undertook was to work with regional representatives who had the expertise about the use cases, the applications, local knowledge, to define a network topology that was fit for purpose that we then incorporated and took through our collective governance and then into the, me and won't appreciate me for this, but uh, the easy part of, of, of building, the delivery. Um, so that important part in response to your question was about being close to our users and understanding their expertise, knowledge, so the solution that was then delivered was absolutely fit for purpose. So I think that's been a very good case study for us and, and, and something we're repeating in many instances. Thank you. So. Now for the computing part, maybe Erwin or Vít. I don't know, maybe <coughs> I'll start. So uh, if I look at uh, uh, your question of success and bottlenecks, so maybe I'll start with the bottleneck. So <laughs> that's more negative and, and with, the, with uh, what's necessary for success. The bottlenecks I can see right now, I think that uh, firstly, if I look at the supercomputing facilities, is I think that enough... Uh, good, really experienced stuff to operate such a, such a, such a infrastructure and provide uh, the enough support for our users, just to use it efficiently, just to know how to use it and so on. This is something what I, uh, what I see as a, as, a, as a really bottleneck because without uh, such a conditions it's difficult uh, to, to, operate the, uh, to operate the infrastructure. And uh, what's necessary just to succeed, I think that the, we need to, uh, of course, be in touch with the with the, let's say, the technology, uh, with the vendors who, pro who provide the technology for us just to really operate the state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure for our users. And then, of course, I would expect that also feedback, uh, whether we are succeeding well or uh, not so well, what expected from our users. That's, a, I think, the, the interaction, this is a very important part of this, uh, of this game. I think that the, this, I, if, 
if I summarize it, that I see those two components very important. But definitely, there is a one very really important thing to have also the <laughs> enough funding for that because <laughs> this, this, you know, the, this whole whole game is not possible to play without uh, sufficient support, uh, financial support from uh, definitely from our funding agencies because it's uh, simply it's costly thing to operate the infrastructure, both from the technological point of view and from the point of view of the human resources, definitely. Erwin, do you want to add something, to your view yeah, from Unique? Uh, I'm in an easy position here now because there are none, none of my users sitting here. <laughs> uh, and, and you should really ask them how satisfied they are. But um, in general, I think uh, as an e-infrastructure for science, for academia, the important thing is that you are really in the science, in academia as well. You establish collaborations with your users. You, uh, you're not only providing the technology, which of course is a given, right? But also work with the users to the best use of this technology. That means a, a key Differenti differentiating factor that, that we as academic centers have is the user support that we can give and that we need to give, that we work with our users to improve the codes, to improve their workflows. Uh, give them new ideas, yeah? What can be done as we get new ideas from them, what they would need, the classical compromise that we have to uh, make between application uh, pull and technology push. But that's the kind of thing that people will never find in uh, the, say, with, 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 the, with the hyperscalers, with the, with the cloud market, right? So, uh, and, and, and that's also to some extent a bottleneck because this is not a scalable service, yeah? yeah. You can have as many application people that, that work in different fields, but you will always have too few. I mean, I, I will try to add two, two ideas behind. One is that in my perspective and in my experience, one of the weakest points which we have is common to the deployment of information and communication technologies across all the disciplines, not only within the academia. And that, that at the end, it's not easy to find non-conservative users who are thinking out of the box on the use of the IT. So that in many cases, I mean, give us more resources, give us that. But as Erwin said, and as I also at least touched this, in fact, what we need are more new ideas and new ways. I mean, everyone is using the Ford case, asked for the something stronger. I will just produce more stronger horses, but I produce cars. And that's something which we need as a, and that's, that's the reason for the close collaboration with the scientists to actually understand well what is, what will be needed, not what is needed today, but what will be needed and then just filling it through money is not the optimal way how to, how to resolve. That's the way what the hyperscalers are doing. They are just pouring the money because they have a lot of them and naturally in many cases they, it works, but from my perspective, the academia should be different, and in many cases is different, that we are doing it through new ideas. And then we need both sides, us to be prepared to go out of the box, and to have the users to be out of the box with their ideas, what they need. Not only asking us to have twice as large or 10 times as large Lumi supercomputer <laughs> to be used exactly the same way as we are using it now or a year ago. So that's, that's one thing which I find, at least within say, the environment I am working in. And the second, which is just more and more philosophical thing, which goes that within the academia, we don't know how to deal with success. And I'm not speaking about envy of the others for the success, but the point that within the academia, when we, say together with the, uh, our users, will we come with a new perfect solution, having additional funding connected to running this solution in a new way is not 
usually within the scopes of these calls, programs, which are predefined, which expect they are capped on, on the money which is, and the successful results are not immediately creating new streams of income to, to make this happen, which makes our environment more difficult to deal with, uh, especially when we really are able to show that these new approaches are fine, they will help, but then we stop because of these caps on the way. And this is more philosophical way because it is not, a, uh, 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 say, uh, because of, of something wrong on one or the other side, I mean, us as providers and the, the, the researchers themselves, it is more a kind of, a, of the environment which we work with, which makes sometimes difficult to actually progress with, with new innovative things, which I am asking for in my first item. Okay, thank you. Maybe, Per, do you want to add some point of view from the Finnish e or Nordic e yeah, infrastructures? Yeah, maybe add something here. So, what I usually say uh, uh, at CEC is that the most important is to be out there with the researchers, pick up and understand what are the needs, what are the ideas that is floating around and the various uh, hopes and so on that, that are there. So we, as a provider and deliver here, shouldn't be taken by surprise when the need is realized. Then we should be prepared and be able to provide efficient and, and uh, effective uh, com uh, comp environment for the users. And uh, I think that is something that we also are obliged to do in the situation, in, as we are publicly funded organization here to support research. That is the major task for an organization like us, to support research. And then it's, we are also obliged to make the best use of the money that we have for operation, for investment and so on. How do we spend this in the most efficient way to get to, get, to deliver the most efficient environment for the researchers? That is what I mean with being effective and efficient. Because as a researcher, you should spend as little time as possible struggling how to use the system. You should use them. And, and that is important and something we have to strive for uh, constantly now. And that is also about the investment here. And I think if it's, we see something that is now also available is how we can do these investments where we now have software and hardware environments where we can serve much more versatile all these different kind of needs out of the same hardware basically and that makes us that we can save money on the operations and how we maintain these systems that we can actually serve a lot of different needs out of of uh, same hardware the hpc needs and so on and i must make some comment to the last presentation i miss uh, uh, the real, I miss Lumi in your road, road map there. You shouldn't forget that Lumi I, is, is a Czech computer, yeah? I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to mention that, but I, but I quite forgot. And, and uh, I, I hadn't spent many, many, many minutes uh, coming here yesterday evening hearing from a power user. When is Lumi going to be upgraded? I need more capacity, yeah? <laughs> If I may just shortly, I, I think the main problem is uh, the understandability of the uh, infrastructure role. There are many pitfalls, you know, like sometimes uh, they are understood as uh, simple service providers. But the service is something you have at the end of some process and the researchers should actually be involved in the process itself. The service is just the outcome. The other thing is that IT is always invincible, uh, invincible invisible. So, if you actually run a successful infrastructure, users don't see the value sometimes in what you do because it's just every day's business as, as always. And there are a couple of pitfalls such as these two that actually make it hard to explain what the infrastructure is and then it translates to the expectations of the users, of the researchers, uh, it translates to the dialogue with the ministry you know, about funding and stuff like that. So I think this is the main pitfall. Do you agree with those views? Um. Okay, so with my user hat on, uh, I, I, I do agree to an extent. So if I, 
Okay, one, one thing to look at it that when we do research uh, uh, projects like the uh, LLM building now, then of course uh, the biggest concern is the size and number of hours we can use. But in academia, uh, uh, this is only one of the projects that we are doing. We are doing other projects which might not be as resource intensive, but which might require other features, so to say, uh, so that we can use them. And one of the main things which it seems to me it's, I mean, two, uh, which is lacking is f the flexibility of using it. If you have to apply three months ahead, no, I, I completely understand if I run the infrastructure, I would have uh, trouble doing it more flexible than you are doing it. But from the, especially the student point of view, they have no idea whether they will be ready at the, uh, when, when they actually get the, the allocation. Uh, and even their supervisors sometimes cannot say exactly. Even in a research project, when you plan carefully your milestones and everything, things happen and then you cannot use it. And then you would need it at a different moment. So that's one thing. And the other thing is the, the ease of use. Uh, because today, I mean, things look very simple. If I explain the project that I was explaining this morning, I say, okay, we just have to take the data, clean it, get text, and then build the model. So this looks extremely simple, and, and it, it is simple from the goal point of view. But then the actual work you have to do is there is, a, there is a lot of steps, you know, tens or hundreds of steps you have to do. So if you look at it from the student perspective and they work on a project, they also have to do a lot of steps. Some of them have nothing to do with HPC, but somewhere in the process there is the HPC. If they have to learn a new system, which is completely different from the local small cluster that each place has. I mean, probably in Finland this is better because universities do not have their own little clusters. But in our case it's different, right? Each university runs its own hardware and suddenly the students need more, right? And then just to be trained uh, in order to use it is a, is a lot of work. So even if they are ready for the allocation, they spend half of the time allotted when they actually do not use the allocation uh, even not for 1% because they have to first find ways how to actually move the data there and, and they have no idea how long it could take and so on. So, so this is something which I see as the two points, the ease of use and the, and the flexibility in time uh, that makes it sort of m more difficult for in, in the academic environment with many, many projects running. So uh, I agree with you very much on the flexibility of use and, and uh, we, we have the luxury of being an institutional center. So we only serve one institution, the Max Planck Society, and there is no allocations. You come and use it, right? So as you said, we don't tell you, okay, you have to start on 1st of May and you are over in the end of August. This very often does not work because of the reasons that you said. There is you know, uh, uncertainties in, in, in progress you make, you find new things, you have techni technical difficulties that prevent you from starting on day one, and all that. So I appreciate that for national centers or even European ones, you probably cannot have that much flexibility, but I, I do believe that the system is too rigid at the moment, and, and, and we need to work on that, both on the national and, and, and European ones, to make that less rigid, more fluent, and so that you can get it through. Um, on the difficulties getting there, I think it's a combination of both, right? Because, yes, there is a, there is a, a, a learning curve. Um, but if you have more flexibility in usage, then you can fit this learning curve in, yeah? <coughs> But if you only get to the system the first day your allocation starts, that's too late. Yeah? So you need to have this ramp up period that needs to be part of the allocation or, or whatever mechanisms that you have that you can train people so that they are ready once they have the large resources available. Okay, so do we have any questions from users, from local users here? Thanks you for the introduction into this uh, into this discussion. And so, seems to me that in academia there is still more users and researchers than the capacities 
which are available. And it uh, seems to me from this, is, uh, it, it causes a lot of problems. It's, it's nice that we have a 400 gig between the Amsterdam and Prague or between the Prague and Brno, but uh, the last mile, that means from the hospital, from the labs, uh, to get into this uh, uh, network is, is sometimes very difficult. Okay, so this is the one question. And the same it's with the computing. It's the rather difficult to get into these resources which are available, rather available, but people are waiting in the queues for a long time. And so the eff efficiency of this, uh, this research is not uh, so flexible as you said, like it could be. Okay, so this is my to discussion. Maybe I can I can answer the the, the, the second one, the cues and so on. So, if I look at the situation, we are always because what I presented, we have acquired enough resources. For example, in Lumigi. <laughs> And we have overloaded, for example, Carolina GPU. So, and we are then, of course, we are looking at the bigger, biggest allocations, and we are trying to discuss with users: Are you able just to move from the those uh, uh, those requirements to the to the Lumi G, for example? And then, and we always promise. And uh, look, so we can support you. We can help you with uh, with supporting the, the your applications. To we can advise you how to do it and so on. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes unfortunately not. But, you know, that's a long-term problem because it's very difficult just to estimate uh, uh, how the users will, will ask for which type of the, of the resource and so on. From this point of view, uh, it's necessary just to really look and try to, let's say, to a little bit reshuffle the, the, the requirements find the new resources. Then, of course, we have, for example, um, possibility to uh, to apply, for example, in the EuroHPC. There are also resources available. Yes. So then I think that we have the capacity which are not, we, we, we are not using really efficiently. Then then this, I think this, we have uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, r reserves there, and I, I can imagine that we can handle that. But of course, uh, it costs something also as a providers because we have to somehow to support the users just to move from the from uh, from uh, from one type of the resource to another one. So, but that, that's I think it's possible. We can be more flexible in that. We can we can uh, I think satisfy more users. But um, unfortunately, of course, the, the comfort just to provide exactly what I what I ask it sometimes uh, it's not not so easy. Yeah, just, I, I hope I a little bit answer this. So, uh, if I may just briefly follow up on that, I think Miroslav Ruda actually even had it in his presentation that we now realize there is a gap between the access policy that we have in a mental centrum when you wait in a queue and the IT for innovations approach when you write a project and then you get the allocation. We are aware of this, this middle space in between and we are trying to figure out how to address that. So to have sort of say, middle-sized allocations for, for these use cases. So just a quick notion to that. I respond to the part around the, the connectivity element you described where there may be constraints on, on the network. I would respond with surprise if that really was the case. Um, you saw in the presentation earlier how actually the research and education network and infrastructure was ready to support the use of the uh, Slovenian supercomputer immediately. There, there weren't constraints there. But of course, technology is difficult. It's multi-domain. Um, and depending where the researcher happens to sit on the campus, if they like to sit in the office that's right at the back of the campus because it looks across a nice green field and they like to see the flowers and the cows, and maybe there's poor campus connectivity at that location, that's a different sort of problem and a challenge. Um, and so, in principle, my response would be is that the, the research and education network and infrastructure of Jean and its national members is there, it's ready, it's, it, it, it's proven, it's capable. And we continually plan to build and operate the network that's ready for the future use cases. But I'm not naive and silly to say that, of course, it works 100% of the time, but that may be at different levels of the network stack. And, and you need to be considering that as well when, uh, when a challenge is raised. Any other questions? Ah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, 
I, I got some question about Meta Center. I'm a new user of Meta Center. For me, it's a very gigantic, how to say, network to use to manage. I would like to um, know if there is uh, some uh, how possibility to manage all the parts because some uh, I have access to several nodes. Some of them, uh, how to say, have different kind of storages. Can I just uh, access one part and see different uh, machine or available? Uh, which what I reparasize would be like? Do I have? Uh, is that possible to just log in one node and then know all the resources I can use and all the free machines I can use? Can I? Can I? Yeah, yeah so I, I think the distributed infrastructure is not easy to handle, so who wants to answer? Yes, yes but what I propose is to give a word Mirek. to Mirek Ruda <laughs> <laughs> to answer to this. <laughs> because this is the question to him, in fact. So the basic question, my, my question is, are you going to stay for tomorrow or? <laughs> because we have uh, several presentations which are related to this one. So, so but the basic answer is yes, it is possible. We can give you, show, show you it offline or if you want tomorrow because we have a few presentations related to this one. General, I would just, quickly comment that sometimes the infrastructure isn't really comprehensible, but you always find people who are able to answer you. So use that. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to ask a different kind of question. Um, generally, you know, we have knowledge across the, across the room uh, full, of, full of IT, full of, uh, full of technical problems, but uh, since we have as the panelists and in the room we have such capacities, uh, I would like to ask uh, you one question. If you were to pick uh, one historical person to replace you, should, should, should not, let's not think that the bus is gonna hit you tomorrow, but should you, should you think of one person that you would like to take your place in case that you couldn't fulfill uh, your, your mandate within what you are given to drive in, in, in across across Europe in, in IT. Who would that be? <laughs> so do you want everyone of the panelists answers? <laughs> or do, I, do, you, do you want to pick up? <laughs> I will I will try to help the others. I will misuse this question and I would say I don't know I, I, I have no idea of whom to ask, but I have one kind of a person which I think could be if, if that person will be able to do today what he has been able to do when he lived, then it could be really a massive progress and the guy was called Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> It's, it's a possibility, although I think, as in the last talk uh, was shown, these geniuses that we had then, they were pretty much alone fighters, right? And I don't think that an e-infrastructure you can build and operate and improve by being a lone fighter. You need somebody who can handle a very interdisciplinary team and collaborations, make sure that all the different disciplines make progress and work together. So in that sense, uh, I don't know who the person was, but take the leader of the Apollo project or take Oppenheimer, I just saw the movie, right? <laughs> uh, not meaning that we should build another Manhattan project, but the complexity is pretty much the same. Yeah, not, not easy question, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I think that I, I completely agree with what er Erwin mentioned, I think that uh, look at the history at the current time, it's not, 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 not fair, because I think that it's a completely different situation right now. I think that uh, if you look at the situation, we have a completely different technologies, and many of them. It's a, uh, while we look at the, at the past, and 
let's say, in the age of the Leonardo da Vinci, it was, it was really uh, not so many possibilities and only few people were able just to, to go directly to, let's say, to, to have these visions and so on, or Gilles Verne or something like that. So those, those are the people who really, Newton in fact, so and the guys like that, so that those uh, were really uh, alone fighters, <laughs> definitely. Now we need to build teams, we need to use uh, more and more technologies, and I would rather say that I would like to see the person with the, with the specific uh, features, like uh, someone who is a visionary, definitely, someone who is able just to put together all the knowledge around and the teams. That's uh, what I would expect, and that's uh, really, really for me difficult whether I can find in the history the right person. So I, I think I, I wouldn't name anyone. I would say that, look, those are the features I would say I would expect. Visionary and be pragmatic in the putting the right person with the right knowledge just to, let's say, to, to build and operate uh, such infrastructures, such a complex infrastructures as we, we, we already have. So those are features I would, I would expect from, from the person. Even, but I am not sure whether I can find uh, very easily someone exactly fulfilling what I would say about the infrastructure in, 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 in the past. So then, then maybe I hope I, I answered. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the concrete name. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can answer the question. But if, if um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, that I can easily be replaced in my current position by Witt or Irvin. They should can easily do the same thing as I do. <laughs> so that, that is not the problem. And that is maybe the only answer I can give on that question. Maybe for vanity, um, one of the 007 characters, you know? That would, that would be nice to be remembered as a James Bond-like character. But I think, like my colleagues here, um, it's more about the attributes that we'd like to pass on a response to this. So, to take artistic license on the question, there may be actually to respond with something like an ant, um, because the significance of an ant is that they are a community-based being and an entity. And it's through that community that the strength in the structures and the things that they achieve, you know, how you're sitting there eating your picnic and your sandwiches on a nice summer's day, and suddenly all of these ants appear from nowhere and carry off incredibly heavy items back to share with the rest of their... their their hive, how they achieve those things working together by working together on building these research infrastructures is a fantastic achievement. None of us can do that alone. So it's really important that we work as that community to achieve those, those big challenges. Well, I have to talk from the user perspective. So if I, if I can uh, uh, look at it from that way and, and look at it from the, from the point of view of using the available resources creatively, because there, you know, as a researcher, there is never enough resources uh, for me or students or whoever. And I remember 30 years ago when I was at IBM and working on the, one of the first machine learning experiments in uh, natural language processing, which was machine translation based on uh, parallel corpora and, and training a system which would do it. And even IBM research didn't have enough resources to do it easily. And I remember the, my supervisors and the team we had, and the three names are uh, significant in that respect. Uh, some people who work in NLP might know the name of Fred Jelinek. Actually, it was a Czech who emigrated in 1948 and made a very good career and was one of, one of the pioneers of machine learning in both speech recognition and, and NLP. And the other two were my immediate boss, Peter Brown, who developed the first NT system based on statistics, and his boss, Bob Mercer, which you, you might know him from politics, which I don't like what he's doing now, but, but he was, but these three were great people in, uh, in uh, f coming up with ideas how to use what was called a farm in, uh, in the IBM environment, how to use those computers to actually make it possible to train the system before the DARPA evaluation came, where we had to score well, otherwise they would cut the funding. So, uh, and they, they had, clever ideas how to do it. There was nothing like a, a, you know, a cloud software or queuing software or anything like that. And we had to do it in a creative way and, we, and, and they managed it in the end. Uh, so, 
So there are people who can do it. Uh, and, and at that time, uh, I mean, even the biggest computers were probably of the power of my cell phone today. So it was, it's about four, four orders of magnitude better. Uh, but, and, but the data then were only two, uh, two times, uh, you know, two orders of magnitude smaller. So you can imagine the challenge. If we have today four times, you know, two orders of magnitude bigger data, uh, we will be in trouble because not even everything that we have in Europe would be sufficient. But those guys were able to do it. So, so this was just what came to my mind. Randall Monroe. I think he's the author of the uh, XKCD. Uh, XKCD? Am I, am I spelling it correctly? Uh, blog. Uh, he was employed with NASA and he's courageous with his, with his thinking. He's young enough and I think he, he would actually make a great contribution to the ENDS metaphor I actually really liked. You know, like you need courageous and energetic people who will, who will push forward new ideas. So someone like him. Okay, so thank you for answers. We are going slowly to the end of this afternoon session. Is there any other question from audience here? Or do we have anyone uh, online? No. So now I would like to ask you to for some final word, because uh, we conclude this session and tomorrow the infrastructure conference continues, but maybe the, you won't, not all of you will be here. So if you want to say some final word, and I would start with uh, Matej here. It's quite easy. Thank you for your time. And please, if you have any questions, any ideas, find someone from the infrastructure and share it with them. Thank you very much. Okay, I would paraphrase one of the three guys I just mentioned, Bob Mercer, who said there is no data like more data. So I can say there is no power like more power. I mean GPU power, of course. <laughs> Thank you for the use of the services that, uh, that we operate and uh, your continued engagement in the projects. Yeah, and I hope to continue the very good collaboration with the institutions here in the Czech Republic. And uh, oh, it was one thing I was thinking of uh, from the presentations we hear here in the afternoon of the how to support European Open Science Cloud and what it means and so on. And there is actually one document that could be worth to uh, that I can share, and that was a document published now in Finland in March this year, a uh, open science and research reference architecture. So it is a document that really tried to describe what are the elements needed to really support open research and science. And taking what are the legal frameworks that or, or laws and so on that are there, what are the institutions. Of course, this document is a bit about Finland, but I think it can be mapped to almost uh, also a Czech situation very much. And I, I would recommend that uh, reading. I think it is, uh, could be worthwhile. So I, <coughs> when I was opening this, uh, uh, this, this conference, I, I mentioned that uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your, all the feedback because it's really valuable for us. This is uh, something that helps us to operate uh, our infrastructures. But I will, at the end, I would add something really important. I think that, uh, uh, I, I think I would, I would recommend to not to be scared just to use the new technologies, new architectures, because, uh, and don't be worried to just to invest uh, some effort also just to use the new, new things. And from the other side, from the other side, we uh, we will try to help you just to just to let's say to use this, this those technology because this is the progress and scientific progress. Sometimes it really pays off just to use and invest the time just to use the new technologies, and then we will try just to be really on the top with the with the really latest technologies, and we are re really ready to, to to support you. But you should you should want to go for her and just use this. Sometimes it's not so easy. I understand such a decision, but we are here just to just to support you. So that's what I wanted to say at the end. Thank you. Uh, I'm pretty much uh, uh, going in the same direction. I, I wish you that the infra set is uh, prospering and developing, and uh, this can only happen if you keep developing the infrastructure together. The technology providers, the infrastructure providers, and the users, right? And 
keep challenging each other. Infrastructure providers should challenge the users, as we just said. Users, of course, need to challenge the infrastructure and technology providers. That's the only way that we can make progress. So keep working together and improving the system. I would just thank you, like I said at the beginning. Thank you for coming, because Erwin took exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> Don't look at the infrastructures as service provider or support organizations. They are research partners, and they have to be considered by both sides, the research infrastructure themselves and the users as partners in the road to improve the science and to improve the research. So thank you very much. I will use the opportunity that I'm the last of the panel. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for being with us. And if you are staying overnight, and especially if you will be here tomorrow, tomorrow you will have much more opportunities to hear about more technical oriented information about the Czech national e-infrastructure. Thank you very much. I would like to thank, uh, thank uh, our presenters, our colleagues, and uh, guests. And we have some presents. afternoon session and now you can join us uh, for the refreshment at this uh, store uh, I think outside there is one hall here and at the same level there is one, one more hall okay yeah great <laughs> so, sorry so thank you again for your participation and now you can join us for the refreshment which is here outside the hall and as well in some other room on the same level here so see you there